today. Thank you all for being here. Uh, so while my presentation is geared toward the broader theme of censorship, I think it's important to note that throughout my presentation, I'll be telling people stories. Um, censorship at its core is designed to take power away from people. So I hope through telling people stories that we can give at least a little bit of that power back. So a brief overview, I'm going to go through some basic background information, just so that we all have a solid foundation to build off of. And then we'll be doing three case studies using archival documents uh, to look at censorship during the Holocaust, not just through the lens of, you know, how censorship factored into the Holocaust, but how it impacted people's lives. So some brief definitions before we get started. The Holocaust was the state-sponsored systematic persecution and annihilation of European Jewry by Nazi Germany and its collaborators between the years 1933 and 1945. Jews were the primary victims of the Holocaust and six million were murdered. However, the Nazis didn't just target Jewish people. They targeted anybody they deemed undesirable. So this included Roma and Sinti, homosexual men, the mentally and physically disabled, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Soviet communists, just to name a few groups. The word censorship uh, is a very interesting one. The word censorship comes from the Latin word censor, or to give as one's opinion. The Roman censors were magistrates who took the census count and served as inspectors of morals and conduct. However, today the word censorship doesn't have such a universal meaning to it anymore in the United States or even in the broader international community as a whole. So for the purpose of my presentation, when I talk about censorship, I'm referring to the suppression of words, images, or ideas whenever some people succeed in imposing their personal, political, or moral values on others. While censorship can be carried out by the government as well as private pressure groups, in my presentation, we'll be talking about censorship that occurred by the Nazi government. Censorship occurred in the broader backdrop of Hitler's rise to power and as the Holocaust of a whole. But to really understand the core of censorship, we have to go all the way back to the end of World War I, which formally ended with the Treaty of Versailles. And this treaty placed the entire blame for World War I onto Germany. And following the end of the war, Germany was facing a really bad depression, massive unemployment, and inflation was through the roofs. The German people really didn't have much to look up to, uh, especially in terms of government. And during this time, Hitler had been imprisoned. He was imprisoned for attempting to overthrow the Weimar Republic. But upon his release from jail in 1924, he and the Nazi party really began to mobilize. Uh, the Nazi party was a political party. And within a few years, they had gained a lot of seats by being elected into the German parliament. Then in 1933, the president of Germany at the time, Paul von Hindenburg, uh, selected Hitler to be the chancellor of Germany. The real turning point, which turned Nazi or which turned Germany into a authoritarian dictatorship from the liberal democracy that it had been was the burning of the Reichstag, which was the German parliamentary building. Historians now would conclude that the Reichstag burned because of arson. But at the time, the Nazis preyed on a fears of a communist takeover that had already existed in Germany. And used it to really elevate Hitler as this godly figure in German society. You know, because of this depression that they were in, uh, they really needed or were looking for someone to look up to, somebody that was going to reclaim Germany as this great and powerful nation, one of the most powerful in the world. And Hitler was that promise for them. Upon his rise into power, one of the first things that he took away was freedom of speech and freedom of the press. And that really kickstarted the rest of his not only censorship measures, but other means of oppression. So one of the first really active means of oppressing the Jewish people were the Nuremberg laws. 
the Nuremberg laws were a series of laws which established first off who was Jewish. So if you had one Jewish grandparent, regardless of your own personal beliefs, you were considered fully Jewish by the Nazi government. Along with this, they also said that people of, who were Jewish or Jewish in their uh, definition of being Jewish had to undergo a certain curfew so they couldn't be out at a certain amount of time. They segregated spaces, especially educational ones. So Jewish students couldn't go to school with non-Jewish students. And one of the more common known Nuremberg laws today would be that all Jewish people had to wear a Star of David on their clothing at all times. Along with these legal measures of persecuting the Jewish people, they also used propaganda to really influence the German people's perceptions, but they also used it as a gauge. So if you look at this tabloid advertisement at the bottom left of the screen here, it pictures a Jewish caricature and the headline reads, he came to Germany like this. And at the bottom, it says, without a solution to the Jewish question, there can be no redemption of humanity. So tabloid advertisements like this not only perpetuated the idea of scapegoating Jews, but it also served as a gauge to see what the German people and the broader international community would put up with or response, respond to the Nazi government. If they didn't protest, if they didn't sanction the Nazis, which they didn't, uh, the Nazis began to understand that they could do these things, they could continue persecuting and dehumanizing the Jewish people, and that it was okay. Nobody was going to retaliate against them. Uh, the next means of persecution uh, and leveling up of their horrific measures was ghettoization, where they forced Jewish people into small sections of town, which had horrible conditions. Uh, there wasn't enough food, enough water, starvation and disease ran rampant because of the crowded conditions. But this was only one step to their final solution. And I put final solution in air quotes because it was a euphemism that the Nazis created for the mass murder of millions and millions of people. So like I mentioned earlier, one of the first steps that the Nazis took was taking away freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Freedom of speech was really interesting because they controlled the radio stations. So the German people didn't have access to like the BBC from England. They were only listening to the speeches and propaganda that the Nazis were putting out. Uh, in the middle of the screen here, you can see a page from a newspaper. It has a whole bunch of advertisement on, advertisements on it. This one right here is advertising, advertising a lesbian ballroom. This was from the 1920s, but following Hitler's rise to power, advertisements like this wouldn't have been allowed to be ran on the press because the Nazis had outlawed homosexual activity. It had become illegal. So these are just two examples of how the Nazis really began taking control and censoring their people. One of the other things that they did was through book burnings or censoring books. Uh, one of the biggest book burn burnings in recorded history occurred in Nazi Germany on May 10th, 1933. It was organized by a group of university students and had over 40,000 people in attendance. This book burning was huge and they didn't just burn books that were so-called Jewish or had Jewish characters in them. They burned any kind of book that they deemed inappropriate or contrary to Nazi ideology. So this included the work of Karl Marx, Helen Keller, or even Ernest Hemingway. At this massive book burning, the head of the Reich Ministry of Enlightenment and Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, gave a very fiery speech where he said, no to decadence and moral corruption, yes to decency and morality in family and state. I consign to the flames the writings of Heinrich Mann, Ernest Glaser, and Eric Kastner. Uh, that's a translation of part of the speech that he gave. Uh, and those were three more people that book whose writings were completely banned in Nazi Germany. So since my presentation is about the censorship of letters, I figured we'd talk a little bit about 
the censorship process of how letters were examined, censored, excised, et cetera, because they tended to follow somewhat typical patterns, which actually began with the writing of the letter itself. There was no one sign in Nazi Germany that said, oh, you can include this in your letters, but you can't include this. So people typically had to undergo a process of self-censorship. You know, they had to avoid, of course, the obvious things, such as not criticizing the Nazi government, which had become illegal in 1934, uh, not making jokes about Hitler, because they knew that, A, their letters wouldn't be sent if they said those things, and also that they might go to jail. But they had to gauge for themselves what other kind of things they couldn't say. So sometimes, instead of saying what they meant, they used code words that they knew or hoped that their relatives or whoever they were writing to would understand what they were trying to say. After the person actually wrote the letter, it went to uh, an office where someone would excise the letter or they would take a really sharp knife, like an X-Acto knife or ink, and they would take out the portions of the letter, which they deemed you know, not right for someone to receive. Uh, I'd like to point out though that the Nazi government wasn't the only group that used censorship. Uh, censorship dates back hundreds and thousands of years and is commonly used during wartime. During World War II, the United States government also used censorship, but it was mainly used in the realm of intelligence gathering. So if a soldier had written the location of his troop on a letter, they didn't want that letter to fall in enemy hands and for them to interpret how the U.S. government was moving and how they were going to attack them. So they would cut that part of the letter out. But the Nazis used it as a means of controlling information, of brainwashing the population to create a favorable narrative that supported what they wanted the people to believe. Beginning in February 1940, the, Nazi German, or the Nazis stopped delivering Jew mail, uh, that's what they called it, and instead they deferred the letter sending process to the Judenrat, which were governing groups that kind of controlled the activities in ghettos. So this photo on the top central part of the screen shows some Judenrat members looking through some letters. And people in ghettos really used letters often as a time, as a way of, what's the word? Um, of maintaining normalcy during their lives. You know, they didn't have texting at this time and phone calls weren't necessarily as common as they are today. So letter writing was a daily practice that people used to exchange words with relatives, to inquire about how they were doing. And pre-war, at the very early stages of the war, they often, you know, if they sensed that tensions were really building, that they could maybe immigrate somewhere that one of their relatives overseas could get them a visa. But during the ghettoization process, it was a way of asking relatives how they were, if they were still alive even. And as people were moved into death and concentration camps, letters kind of shifted their form. Uh, it Some of the death and concentration camps offered a lever, letter delivering service. But the people in these camps knew that they couldn't write what was actually happening to them. And most of all, they wanted to warn their relatives of what was really going on so that they weren't painting this glamorous picture of what was happening only for their families to end up being murdered later on. So they would find either a sympathetic soldier or find these drop-off locations where someone would pick up the letters and hopefully deliver it to their families. Sadly, by this point of the war, however, a lot of the recipients or intended recipients of these letters had already been deported or murdered, so they never actually received the letters that were intended for them. Some people were so desperate for people to hear their stories and to know what was happening to them that they would write letters on any pieces of paper that they could find. And they would throw them out of cattle cars or over barbed wire fences, just in the hopes that somebody would find them and tell their stories or stop what was happening. So this brings me to my first book recommendation for today. 
Uh, throughout the rest of my presentation, I'll be including some books that have been banned in libraries around the United States. Uh, I, as much as we'd like to think that censorship doesn't affect us today, it very much does. And the banning of books is one way that censorship is very prevalent in our lives today. I'll have a slide at the very end of my presentation with all of the books that I'll be recommending throughout the rest of this. So uh, y'all are free to take a photo of it at the end and it has some of the call numbers where you could locate it in the San Antonio Public Library System. Um, but to begin with, the book Mouse was banned in the McMinn County School by the McMinn County School Board of Tennessee in January of 2022. So this is very recent. And they banned it because of swear words and disturbing imagery. Uh, the school board unanimously banned the book, and it sparked a lot of outrage in the Holocaust education community. The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum put a statement out. Uh, condemning the actions of the school board, as well as the author of the book, Art Spiegelman himself. Uh, he said, and I quote, this is disturbing imagery, but you know what? It's disturbing history. Mouse is a graphic novel written by Art Spiegelman uh, that details the story of his father, who was deported and imprisoned in uh, camps such as Auschwitz and Dachau. The book does a really great visual job of showing the dynamics and the power dynamics in Nazi Germany, showing the Nazis as cats and the Jews as mice. It's an elementary book because the story goes through a child asking his father what had happened to him during the war about his past. It's very, very well done. And if you're interested, it is located in the San Antonio Public Library System. So the first example I'd like to tell you about today is of the Brady family. The Brady family consisted of Marquetta, her husband, Carol, and their two children, Hannah and George. The Bradys were from a little town called Nova Mesto na Morave in Czechoslovakia, which you can see on the map at the top left of your screen. The Bradys were very well integrated into their community, despite the fact that they were one of the only few Jewish families that existed there. Uh, Carol was a volunteer firefighter and the captain of his soccer team, and Marquetta was friends with many poets and writers because she was very well loved and was described as having a very uh, joyful and attractive personality because she was just so kind. But after the Nazis invaded and took over their town, the family became very isolated from the rest of their community. The children could no longer go to school with their peers. A lot of their friends stopped talking to them because they were Jewish. And you know, one of the things that really impacted the children was the fact that their whole lives had been upended overnight. Uh, Hannah and George actually wrote down their hopes and dreams for the future and stuffed them in a bottle and buried it because they really just wanted their lives back, their past lives back. In 1941, Marquetta was deported to Ravensbrück concentration camp. Uh, this was a camp only for women, and the conditions were absolutely horrendous. The women who were deported there had to undergo really harsh forced labor, such as in these two photos. These are women working in a factory, and at the top, there are women's, there are some women digging. Uh, conditions were extremely unsanitary. They were crowded. And some of the women even had to undergo forced medical experiments. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting scholarship being done nowadays about these medical experiments and really trying to uncover uh, what exactly happened. So if you're interested in that, you can reach out and I can give you some resources. But it was at Ravensbrück concentration camp that Marquetta wrote a letter to her family. Uh, here's a copy of the letter here, and you can see up here it includes the censorship regulations. So I'll read them to you now. They read in translation, every prisoner in this protective custody is allowed to send and receive a letter or card once a month. The rows in the letter have to be written clearly, readable, and in ink. The letter must not exceed two pages with 15 rows each. All mail has to have an exact sender, block, and prisoner number on it. Each writing must only have one stamp enclosed. Additional stamps will be confiscated in favor of destitute prisoners. Mail that doesn't comply with the requirements will not be delivered. Envelopes must not be padded, 
receiving parcels with any content is not allowed. Cash remittances are permitted, but have to be issued via postal money order. Deposits in the letter are prohibited. Everything can be bought in the camp. Petitions for release of the protective custody to the camp lead are pointless. The sending of images and pictures is prohibited. Signed, the director of the camp. So through this little blurb there, you can really see that they didn't say what they could and couldn't write, but they were very controlling, even down to how many postage stamps they could have or if they could or couldn't have photographs. Despite the fact that these restrictions were so tight, Marquetta's letter is very optimistic. Uh, she writes asking her family how they are, how their extended family were doing, um, but she reveals very little about her own personal situation, which was no doubt absolutely horrible. Um, it raises a lot of questions about whether she was trying to maintain her role as a maternal figure, not wanting to worry her family, but wanting to let them know that she was okay, or if she was so scared of the censorship regulations that she decided just to omit any kind of information that could potentially be censored or prevent her letter from being sent. As much as we'd like to know the answers to these questions, Marquetta was murdered in Auschwitz in 1942. Her husband Carol and daughter Hannah were also murdered in Auschwitz in 1942 and 1994, respectively. Uh, the only member of their family to survive was George, who eventually immigrated to Canada, where he passed away in 2019. Despite the fact that the entire family has now passed away, there are a lot of items that remain from their life, such as Marquetta's letter, but also the suitcase that Hannah had carried with her on her way to the camps that she was eventually taken to. Um, the suitcase was eventually taken to the Tokyo Holocaust Museum, where some of the staff there did really in-depth research into her life, and they turned it into the best-selling children's book, Hannah's Suitcase, which is available in physical form through the San Antonio Public Library, if you are interested. The pain and power of motherhood is one of the most central themes in the book, Sophie's Choice. This book was banned in 2001 in La Mirada, California for sexual content. However, after the students heard of what their school board had did, they protested and actually had the book returned to shelves. This book is really interesting because it doesn't take place during the Holocaust, but rather after. It tells the story of a woman who is caught between an abusive lover and a writer who is determined to uncover her painful past. It does a great job of showing not only the physical but emotional wounds that Holocaust survivors still had to deal with following liberation. Uh, this book is available in physical form, large print, ebook, and movie form if you are interested in checking it out. This letter was written not by a Jewish person, but actually by a non-Jewish person. It was sent from a Soviet laborer in May of 1943 from a work camp in Germany. We know that this woman was not Jewish because of her greeting in the letter, which reads, Christ is risen. Uh, this is an Orthodox Easter greeting. This letter is particularly interesting because it's not censored. Uh, this woman found a sympathetic soldier to pass on her letter instead of going through the formal method of sending posts. Um, she writes in her letter about how she had tried to send earlier letters, but how she couldn't exactly say what was happening to her and that her family didn't really understand what was actually going on. She writes in translation, in all my earlier letters, I kept quiet about everything, but if I had described things, the letters would not have reached you, and in those letters, you would have had to understand some hints. So in this letter, she talks about starvation, the really crowded conditions, uh, the unsanitary nature of their living quarters, the constant surveillance by soldiers, and a lot more. She really details just how much effort she put in into trying 
to let her family know of what was happening because life as a laborer in Germany was portrayed as this ideal, but she really wanted to impart that it was nothing of that sort. Uh, she is slightly optimistic in the letter she says, we'll survive all this, but she warns her family, uh, if they're going to send one of you to Germany, run away, don't even think about it. Uh, she also says in this letter, after you know she had written it, that she uh, had tried so many times to get her family uh, some type of letter that wasn't censored. She said, now I'm writing clearly and putting it directly into the hands of this soldier. So far, I've made every effort to get a letter to you through a soldier. One letter was given to a soldier on December 13th. It did not reach you. Another was written on April 15th, but not handed on by a soldier. He promised, but did not come. In general, it's very hard to hand on letters for delivery in our circumstances. After all, the police guard us and they also escort us to work so that it's impossible to linger for even a minute. In these letters, I described everything. If you had received them, you would really know how we are living. Uh, throughout other parts of the letter, she talks about how her and her family had had some means of communication, but that her family had asked her questions about, you know, how she was dining, if they were eating quail and all of these really decadent, delicious foods. But through this letter, she tells them that that couldn't be further from the truth. This letter, because of its uncensored nature, was used in trial following the end of World War II by the Soviet government about the treatment of laborers in Germany. While we don't know the fate or even the name of this woman, her letter has been pretty instrumental in understanding what life was like as a laborer. The Diary of a Young Girl by Anne Frank is probably one of the most well-known Holocaust books. It's been translated into over 70 languages and has sold over 50 million copies. In despite and probably in part because of the popularity of this book, it's undergone many censorship challenges since the decades of its publication. The first noted challenge to this book was in 1982 uh, by a school board in Wise County, Virginia. But since then, the American Library Association has documented over 10 more challenges to this book since the year 1990. Most recently, in Katy, Texas, which isn't far from San Antonio, the school board banned the illustrated copy of this book because of the sexual content that included where Anne described her experiences of puberty or even her sexual desires for some of her friends. If you're interested in learning more about not just Holocaust books that have been banned recently or in the past few decades, but just generally about books that have been banned, uh, you could go to the American Library Association website. They release yearly reports about the most banned books around the United States or pen.org, like a pen you write with. They all have really great reporting services. So if you hear about a book that's being banned, you can report it, um, or you could just see some of the books that are commonly banned in the United States. The final example I'll be telling you about is the story of two boys, Norbert Bicalis at the bottom of the screen here, and B. Warshower at the top of the screen here. Uh, I don't have B's first name, so I'll just be referring to him by his first initial. Norbert B. Callis was born on January 7, 1929 in Berlin. His family had moved here during the interwar period. His father had fought in World War I, and his mother had originally been from Poland. They married after the war and moved to Germany, where they had Norbert's brother, who was eight years older than him, and Norbert. In 1938, however, Norbert's brother and his father were deported. However, they were allowed to return in 1939 to settle up some of their affairs. It was when they came back that Norbert's father registered him for a kinder transport, which was a special type of immigration for children during the Holocaust. So Norbert was registered for this kinder transport and they sent Norbert's brother to go live with an aunt and uncle somewhere else. Um, and it was while Norbert was about to be on his kinder transport 
that his parents were deported and murdered. Um, but Norbert was sent on the kinder transport to northern France, where he uh, was sent to a home there. But in 1940, after the Germans had invaded northern France, he had to be moved to another home for his safety. This home was the Habans Children's Home, and it was here that Norbert met B. The two became quick friends, and even Norbert, after Norbert had to leave uh, to find another home because of safety concerns again, uh, the two boys stayed in contact. Uh, by this point, they had become teenagers, uh, but they remained in constant contact, sending letters and postcards to each other. On the screen here is one of the postcards that B had sent Norbert. And I think that this postcard really illustrates just how tight the censorship regulations got. Uh, it says that he's only allowed to fill in the lines on the postcard and that he can't write outside of those. So he can only say what they're basically telling him to say. But despite the fact that the censorship regulations were so restrictive, B manages to infuse his personality in here. Uh, he has some misspellings and he uses an exclamation point uh, to give it a bit of enthusiasm and flavor, even though you know, he didn't have much room for expression within it. Uh, Norbert was moved many, many more times throughout the course of World War II, and he was even arrested at one point for being smuggled over the Swiss border. But he eventually settled in the Home de la Forêt, which was ran by the OSC. The OSC, or the Oeuvre de Secours aux Enfants, was a group that was originally designed to provide medical assistance to Jews who suffered Soviet pogroms. During the Holocaust, however, they became known for helping Jewish children uh, find homes for safety. They remained active after World War II and the Holocaust, providing medical assistance and support for children who had been orphaned, uh, who were refugees, or had been recently liberated from death and concentration camps. But Norbert stayed at the Home de la Forêt from April 1944 and till July of 1946. It was at this home that he received news from the American Red Cross that his brother had actually survived. His brother had ended up being married and Norbert and his brother were reunited after many years of separation on Norbert's 17th birthday. After this, Norbert received an American visa and immigrated to New York where he is still alive today at the age of 93. The experiences of children during the Holocaust is also present in the book Number the Stars by Lois Lowry. This book is about 150 pages and is written for children in mind. Uh, this book was challenged at a school in Washington state over the use of the word damn and was fully banned by the Department of Education at Tarsus American College in Turkey. The Department of Education visited a classroom which was teaching this book, and after reading only one paragraph of the book, deemed it inappropriate for readers. Um, this book does a really good job of showing at an elementary level uh, how people helped others during the Holocaust, how they were upstanders and saved people even when it came to the detriment of their own safety. It talks about a girl in Denmark, who went to go live as a non-Jewish person with a non-Jewish family, hiding in plain sight. Uh, this book is available in several forms through the San Antonio Public Library system, if you're interested. So before I end my presentation, I'd like to leave you all with two quotes, which I think really illustrate not just censorship as a means of control, but as a precursor to persecution. So, Harry Truman once said, once a government is committed to the principle of silencing the voice of opposition, it is only one way to go, and that is down the path of increasingly repressive measures until it becomes a source of terror to all its citizens and creates a country where everyone lives in fear. This idea of upholding the voice of the minority is also present in the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which reads, Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. From 
anti-Semitism to censorship and even beyond. I think it's really important to tell the stories of history now more than ever before. Even the youngest Holocaust survivors today are in their late 80s. And the sad reality is that many of them are dying. It's our duty, not only as citizens, but as historians, to continue to tell their stories so that the atrocities of the past aren't repeated. I think it's our duty to ensure that their voices aren't censor censored forever and that they don't die with them. So if you have any questions about my presentation today or about the Holocaust as a whole, uh, we'll be having a Q&A shortly, but I'd highly encourage you to check out the resources at the Holocaust Memorial Museum of San Antonio at hmmsa.org. And now that you know, what will you do? Uh, here's the slide that I promised with all of the books that I mentioned today. Uh, so feel free to take a photo of it. Um, if you're looking, the San Antonio Public Library has a great online catalog that's really easy to search. Um, so you can find it hopefully at a branch near you. Thank you so much, Rena, for such a wonderful presentation on such an important topic.